you probably have noticed that Apple in particular created a huge buzz about Atmos about a year ago um, when they added spatial audio support to new Macs and uh, iPhones, all the iOS devices. Um, so Atmos and spatial audio are a big complicated topic that I can't possibly cover in this talk, but I'm going to try and explain or give you an idea of what they're about and why you might be interested and what some of the implications of that are if you are. Um, so in a nutshell, Atmos is surround sound on steroids. Um, I should say that Atmos is one type of immersive audio, um, which is the general name given to 3D or spatial audio. There's also Sony 360 and DTS-X are alternative um, options. But Atmos is the one that everybody's excited about because that's the one that Apple have got behind. And obviously they have a huge amount of marketing clout and influence. So you probably know about normal surround sound that you would find on a DVD or a Blu-ray, where as well as the left and right speakers, you typically have a center speaker and two surround speakers at the back. That was then augmented by 7.1 surround sound, where you had an extra two speakers at the side to give you extra accuracy when you're panning sounds around the listener. And Atmos goes one step further than that by adding height information to the mix. So you have two, possibly four, or maybe even six speakers up in the roof, which means that the, uh, the creative person mixing or mastering the project can literally choose to pan the sound anywhere around someone over their head, anywhere in 3D space, which is kind of interesting to start with, but is not really, I would say, the most uh, innovative or exciting thing about Atmos. Um, and the thing that I think is the most innovative and exciting thing about Atmos is that it's what's called an object-based mixing system. So when you think about 5.1 or even stereo, when you export your final master to be delivered to wherever it's going to be distributed, you basically are exporting everything or rendering everything that's in the mix session down to two channels for stereo, which is left and right. Six channels in 5.1, which is the three front channels, the two back ones, and the low frequency effects, the subwoofer. 7.1, you've got eight channels and so on. You can do that in Atmos as well. And if you do, then that's referred to as a bed. So you could have a 7.1.2, where the 0.2 at the end is the, the height speakers, or 7.1.4 if you've got four height speakers. Um, or you could have 5.1 or whatever you choose. But if you do that, those are the only speakers that will be used when you play the file back. Whereas the other option you have is to um, assign an audio stream to be what's called an object. And Probably the best example I could give you is if you think about feature films, because all this Atmos stuff comes from cinemas, uh, which is where Dolby originally developed it. Imagine a helicopter. You possibly hear a helicopter right now. If you wanted to pan that so that it flies around in circles above everybody's heads in the cinema, um, you could use a surround panner like this one here to do that. Um, but rather in Atmos, rather than rendering that out, just to say the four height speakers, you can just define it as an object. The limitation of sending it to a bed, which is the, the speakers, is that say you went into a cinema where you could have up to 64 different speakers in the playback system, you're still only going to be using those 10 or 12, whatever it is, channels in the bed, and the rest of the speakers wouldn't be part of the mix. If you define it as an object, when you save the file out to send it off for replication or streaming or whatever, the object, the helicopter, is saved as a separate, it's like a channel or a stem in a normal mix, plus information telling the playback system what to do with it. So you have a helicopter, plus the instructions fly around people's heads in the way that I moved the surround panel when I was mixing. And what that means is that when it's played back, the renderer can generate the best possible version of that behavior. So if you have 64 speakers, they could all potentially be involved in flying that helicopter around your head. Or if it was only played back on a 5.1 system that didn't have the height speakers, it would do its best to simulate that effect with the speakers that it had. So Atmos, which is object-based, is what's called speaker agnostic. It's not that it doesn't care. 
how many speakers there are at the end, it's that it's completely flexible. It can deal with 64 or 32 or 12 or 10 or however, um, which obviously is going to give you the best possible results on any playback system. So that's very clever in itself. But you might well ask, well, how does that help me if I'm listening on headphones? You know, how can we have a surround sound effect with only two speakers? Which is not as crazy a suggestion as it might sound because we only have two ears uh, and we manage to perceive sound coming from all around us in the world every day. So what Atmos does, and this is the really clever bit, um, is it takes account of the fact that when we listen, when we hear sounds, the sound doesn't go straight from the air to our um, inner ear. It doesn't go straight into your ear. It goes around your head. It's reflected to some extent off your body, and it's certainly influenced by the, the shape, the detailed shape of your ear. So a sound that's coming to me from over there, or let's say over there, comes in and hits this ear. The shape of my ear changes that sound a little bit, and then it gets to my inner ear. This ear, it has to go around my head. There's a delay because one ear is further away from the other, and the shape of my ear is similar, but it's facing the other way. It's oriented differently. Um, it adds, if you like, a sonic fingerprint to the sound. And that's even more extreme with the sound that comes from behind me, where it hits the back of my head, and it, the, you can just imagine the, the shape of your ears completely changes the sound. And because we've all been listening to this ever since we were born, our brains are fantastically good at interpreting the clues that are embedded in this sonic fingerprint, if you like, to figure out where the sounds are coming from. You can try it yourself, if you like, not now, but <laughs> after the session. If you just play some music, or even better, some pink noise, if you're nerdy enough to have some on your phone, or to find some, just play it from a phone speaker and just move it around your head, or even better, get somebody else to move it around your head. You close your eyes. You can still get a sense of where that sound is coming from. And for the, if you're technically minded, one of the biggest things that changes is that you will hear a notch in the frequency spectrum. And that notch, it's like an EQ curve, and it actually moves up and down, particularly with height. So there's a big clue to our brains as to where the sounds are coming from. And you can make recordings that take advantage of all of this um, clever stuff that our brains are doing. You could have a dummy head with fake ears on it and microphones mounted inside that, the head. Um, I have a pair of binaural mics that you can actually wear in your ears. So I can make a binaural recording for myself. Uh, binaural is two ears and is the name given to this type of recording rather than, say, a straight stereo recording with two ordinary microphones. Um, and in fact, I got my binaural mic because I'm a nerd for Christmas, um, and I was playing around with it sitting in the living room, and then I thought, I don't have any headphones to listen to this on. So I went into my home studio, put the headphones on, and thought, oh, the computer's playing back some audio. And then I did a double take, and I thought, no, it's not, because the computer's off, because it's Christmas, and anyway, my headphones are plugged into there. So the sound that I thought I was hearing was the sound of the TV that I'd recorded in the living room, and the representation of it was so realistic that I actually thought the sound was in the room with me in my home studio. So that's binaural recording and binaural audio. And what Atmos does that is incredibly clever is if you are listening on headphones or earbuds, it attempts to emulate how the sound, the 3D mix that you've created in Dolby Atmos with all of those objects, how it would sound if you were listening to a binaural recording. So it says, OK, the sound is behind me, therefore I'm going to add this kind of notch here, this kind of delay because of the difference in the ears, the filtering, all the rest of it. And it does its best to emulate that binaural effect. And it does a pretty good job. It's not perfect because, of course, all of us have different heads and different ears. Um, so it uses, uh, I guess, an average, if you like, head size, ear spacing, um, head-related transfer function. HRTF is a technical name for the processing that it applies. And that means we've got a demo set up here, which we're going to try um, and let a few people listen to. Um, it may work really well for some people. It may work less well for other people. For me, it's pretty good, especially for behind and above. I don't get the impression that things are coming directly in front of me. Uh, when I pan things across the front, it kind of seems to wander up above my eyebrows. Um, 
But at one point where it is effective is actually if you're watching Apple TV. So one of the things that Apple added with spatial audio was the ability to stream Atmos. So if you're watching on a device or on a TV and you have a pair of um, headphones in, then suddenly all those clues kind of come together. The visual connects with what I'm hearing and it really does seem to be coming from the TV. And just as a sidebar, um, Apple have added another function to the Apple Spatial, which is not part of Dolby Atmos, uh, called head tracking. Um, what that means is that, say you're watching the TV and you're wearing a pair of Apple earbuds, when you turn your head, the earbuds will tell the TV or your device, whatever it is, the, that you've moved your head. And since the sound should be coming from over there, when you look over here, it pans the sound around like that. So the sound apparently stays in the same place in the room, um, which is actually uncannily effective, I have to say. So, Mark, I meant to ask you about this. Should we do the demonstration now? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Um, so if, how many headphones have you got? Five. If five people want to come up to the front, I'll quickly introduce you. So this is Logic. Apple have recently added Atmos support to Logic. Um, and I've got a couple of instruments here, and you can see here I've got a surround panner. So I can uh, move this, that's panning around the head. You can see the top half is the, the top-down view with the front here, left, right, and here are the rear. And then behind, I've got this uh, ability to pan the height information. So that's looking at the back of the head, um, panning above. And if I enable some automation here, I was going to do the... Oh, it is already automated, enabled. That's okay. If I just start off by playing... So you can see there, this, I've got these the wrong way around really, I'll put them over. So if you like, this surround panner is the input where I'm controlling where in the space it should go. And this is a representation of the room, so that's looking down, we're looking from behind towards, this is where you might have a, a, a screen if you had a home cinema. And when I hit play, you should be able to see the blue dot moving. So the idea is that it goes up and over the top of your head and then down. is I'll just disable the binaural emulation. And that means that instead of hearing that emulation of it going over your head, you'll just hear a straight left to right pan, which I think you'll, even if it doesn't sound like it's going over your head to you initially when you hear it, it's just a straight linear. And if I re-enable it, So, give me a thumbs up if you think that's working, just out of interest. One, two, three. Everybody thinks that's working. Okay, that's cool. Okay, let's try this example. Okay, Now, remember, we're listening to this in stereo because we don't have an Atmos um, rig in here. The really clever thing about this is that if you created a master, so once you've set up your mix with this, you've done all the automation, you've got to the end, you're ready to export. You ex export what's called an ADM, which doesn't stand for an Atmos digital master file, confusingly. I can't remember what it does stand for. 
But that's the master file. That goes off. It has all of those objects, all of that metadata involved to tell the, the renderer what to do. That file gets encoded by Apple or whoever. I mean, you can also get these things on Tidal and Amazon. When it gets played back, if somebody has an Apple TV and they plug that directly into their surround amp and they have a full 7.1.4 playback system, they will get full-blown surround sound, all the multi-channel stuff. If they have 5.1, they'll get 5.1. If they have stereo, they'll get stereo. If they have headphones, all from the same file being streamed. So that's the bit that's really clever about it. And I'm going to come back, rem try and remember that, because I'm going to come back to that in a minute when we talk about you know, what this means for the, for the industry. So you know, th this is why people are excited, because Dolby Atmos does give you some kind of surround sound effect, even if you're just listening on headphones. And that's important because of one of the big objections to the whole idea, which I'll get onto in a second. Um, obviously, it's best if you listen on speakers. Um, but, I mean, another thing you can do is, if you like, you can enable head tracking on an iPhone or an iPad. or um, there's, You can also get a similar effect on a MacBook Pro. Um, you can also get a similar effect on, there's the Amazon Echo Studio, which is a little, just a single unit, but it has speakers that fire off in multiple directions. And supposedly analyzes the room and tries to figure out to bounce the sound off the walls to give you a surround sound effect. So there are lots of ways to get not the full Atmos experience that you would have if you had a, a home cinema setup, but some kind of um, benefit from the, from the format. So the question is, does this mean we all have to start mixing in immersive? Um, and that's difficult to answer. You know, I would really like it if this is a success. I, I love surround sound. I, mixed in surround for dvd and blu-ray for for years i'm really enjoying playing around with atmos i i love the immersive effect of it filling up the room and you know um really helping people kind of just gives you extra creative tools when you're mixing and mastering um but that's you know that's just me um i also one of the other benefits of uh, the format just to get a little bit um even more nerdy um, is, so you've probably all heard of the loudness war. Um, this pressure to make things louder and louder and louder. One of the technical limitations of the Atmos format is that in order to take these, because you can have 128 objects in a mix, should you want, and you can have multiple beds. So, and, and that's not rare. You know, in a, in a pop song, you could easily have 40, 50, 60 different objects as part of the mix. And you surround reverbs and all kinds of stuff and, and plenty of automation, you know, you can, uh, I don't know, um, a phased shaker sound that, you know, you would do in stereo. You can have it swirling around your head or moving up and down or pretty much anything you like. Um, in order to have the flexibility for the renderer to create a convincing version of that on multiple speaker systems, but also on earbuds, and I think it's even possible to listen in mono potentially, um, you have to have a lot more headroom than you need just for straight stereo or just for straight playback, right? Because it's almost impossible to predict in advance exactly what will happen to all of those objects when they get combined into one of these different playback scenarios. And the mixer has no idea which system it's going to be played back on. So that means that Dolby have specified that the loudest song on an Atmos album should be minus 18 LUFS. LUFS is a measure of loudness. That might mean nothing to you, but if I tell you that it's normal for pop and rock releases at the moment to be released at minus eight LUFS, and in some cases as high as minus six or even minus four. 10 dB, I mean, six dBs is roughly a doubling of the power. So 10 dBs is almost four times the power. So an Atmos mix is actually technically recorded into the format way lower than a stereo mix, to the point where Apple have decided to enable their sound check system, which evens out level differences, because the way I heard it, uh, the developers at Apple got so fed up with being blasted by switching between Atmos and stereo on their phones. We've been trying to get them to do this for years, and it's, it's Atmos that finally makes them make the change. The reason I mention it is it's exciting to me, because when you are required to not deliver mixes above a certain loudness, and you want to get some musical structure into an album, it means you say, okay, this song is the loudest, that's going to be minus 18. Everything else has to be mastered, mixed to fit in with that. I've got 18 dBs of peak headroom that I can do what I like with. 
and people are using that really creatively. And so I'm excited about that, partly because it sounds fantastic, partly because that is exactly what people are doing. They're not, I mean, if you have something where the stereo mix was super crushed, super dense to begin with, you want to preserve some of that feel, some of that intensity, some of that um, density in the Atmos version, but you've still got the peak headroom to play with. So people are making Atmos mixes that still sound, because I get this all the time, I say to people, you should mix with more dynamics, and they say, no, 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 I need it for the sound. And Atmos mixes prove that that's not the case because they have the sound, but they also have way more dynamics. So that's a really positive thing, I think, that um, could come out of this. More positives. Um, Apple are hugely behind the format. You know, they've invested all of this um, time, effort, marketing money into, they are really heavily encouraging labels to produce Atmos mixes of almost everything that they do. Um, so that puts a big incentive in the industry for people to start taking, paying attention to this and, and doing this. There are more options to listen. You've got AirPods, you've got soundbars, new Macs, things like the Amazon Echo, Echo Studio. And it's going to sound better because I mentioned that the binaural emulation you guys were listening to there is based on a sort of an average person or head, if you like. Um, already Dolby have the beta version of a personalized HRTF function for using with this type of software. So you can, I don't, I don't know whether you film your head or scan, you do something with your mobile phone. I'm, I haven't signed up yet. I'm excited to try it. And you'll get a personalized binaural profile for your head, which should give you even better binaural uh, emulation when you listen. So potentially in the future, when you go to buy an iPhone, they might do a 3D scan of your head. You might think that's a good or a bad thing. Um, that's exciting. The other thing I would say is that Dolby and Apple are creating their binaural emulations slightly differently. Um, when it was released, I wasn't that impressed with the Apple method. Quite a lot of the stuff I thought sounded really quite bad. But they have responded to that criticism. They've already improved it. And everybody who's working in this field says that they are continuing to improve it. They want to make it better and better and better. So, and Dolby are upgrading their binaural emulation as well. So ultimately in future you might have something that really does sound like a surround sound system on headphones which i think is quite an exciting possibility um they are making all of this stuff more and more accessible um, atmos has been built into nuendo for a while now it's built into logic with the latest version so you don't even have to i mean you can get a free trial of the atmos stuff if you're using logic or uh, if you're using pro tools or uh, reaper or one of those kind of tools you get 90 day free trial but if you have access to Logic, if you upgrade to the latest version, you're already going to uh, have that available to you. Some of the negatives, some of the obstacles, you know, it's new tech, it's still evolving. It costs a lot to create an Atmos mix room. You're probably talking about a minimum of £10,000 worth of speakers and converters and monitor controllers and all the rest of it. It's tricky to get it set up and to get it done right, but Dolby are being very proactive in going out and helping people with that. You know, genuine full Atmos systems are thin on the ground out in the world. There's not many people who have full surround sound, especially not with high speakers in the ceiling and all the rest of it in their homes. Um, and most of the mixes that are available at the moment are remixes of stuff that already exists in stereo rather than imagined from the ground up to take advantage of the format. Um, but I would turn that around and suggest that that's also a positive because uh, for example, John Hopkins' latest album um, is a, an ambient thing that was conceived for Atmos from the ground up. Um, sounds amazing. I think we're going to see more and more projects like that that really start to, just like we did in the early days of stereo, more and more people using the format creatively to get fantastic results. So hopefully, you know, there's a, there's a positive future for it. It could all fizzle out. I mean, an interesting experiment for you guys would be to start asking your non-musician, non-audio tech friends, do you know about Apple Spatial? What do you think of it? Do you care? Um, because there's lots of people out there saying, yeah, everybody in the industry is super excited about this because it means work and it means creativity, but nobody else gives a damn. Um, I have no idea how true that is and whether that will change. Maybe with all of these different ways to listen, it will start to, to change and people will be encouraged to upgrade their systems as well. And then the last thing before we get to the Q&A, um, if you wanted some examples to listen to, I would recommend Happier Than Ever by Billie Eilish, Future Nostalgia by Dua Lipa, um, 
Montero by Lil Nas X, Solar Power by Lord, and Sour by Olivia Rodrigo are all huge selling, huge current releases um, where the Atmos versions sound either amazing or really good. And in particular, in comparison to the stereo, because they have so much more in the way of dynamics. So I'd really encourage you to check those out. That's what I've got. Cool. Thanks very much, Ian. Pleasure. So there must be... <laughs> there must be some questions, I'm sure. Um, okay, so straight away, Mr. Dr. Bill Campbell. Uh, questions, sir. Uh, can we run that? Hi, Ian. Hi. Um, two questions for you, really. Um, one is, do you see this as broadcastable at some point in the future? Um, and the other is, does uh, Dolby Atmos increase the sweet spot of listening to it? Okay. Um, is it broadcastable? Kind of depends what you mean. Uh, I mean, it's already being broadcast. Um, Netflix and Amazon and Apple TV are all distributing TV shows with Atmos as the soundtrack. You'll get the same Atmos soundtrack that you got in the cinema, um, although data compressed. Um, and yeah, I mean, Apple Music has it built in. So if you have an, app, an iPhone 7 or later, you can listen to the binaural version on your iPhone. Um, I'm looking forward to the time when you can plug a cable into your Mac and stream it through the Mac into a studio or a home listening environment. That hasn't happened yet, but you can do it with an Apple TV. So, yes. Um, you could radio. Uh, digital radio, I guess, in theory. Yeah, but I don't know the answer to that. That would be, I'd have to, I don't see any reason. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a data stream. If you can, any kind of data stream you can get out to a receiver. I think most consumer listening devices wouldn't have, um, I th and, you know, radio, versus online, you know, listening to something on a phone. It's kind of grey area there. Um, remind me what your second question was? Oh, the sweet spot. Typically, no. I mean, it's interesting for me standing here listening to that demo next to this speaker and watching what it was supposed to be doing here, and it kind of went the opposite way because it would come over this way and get closer, which felt like it was going behind me when it should have been in front. That's an example of, you know, it doesn't work for me here. I mean, that was binaural, but it, it wouldn't work with surround sound speakers either. Sort of extreme cases, if you had something that flew from the back to the front, that would work almost anywhere in the room. But one of the things about Atmos mixing rooms is a lot of them have software to make sure that the delays from the speakers and the frequency content and all the rest of it is uh, good enough to get a really accurate response. And that actually typically ends up with a really small sweet spot because it's basically focused on the place where you're mixing. So it kind of swings and roundabouts, you know? I mean, it, it works in the kind of the cinema sense of, yeah, helicopters flying and all the rest of it. The kind of really subtle stuff, if you were listening to a recording in, I don't know, Notre Dame Cathedral or something, trying to capture the acoustic, that would probably only work right in the, in the actual sweet spot. Anyone else? Okay, I have a couple of questions that our students uh, came up with mm -hmm. for you. Um, I'm going to go straight in with the controversialist one. Controversialist. Um, is the consumer asking for Dolby Atmos or is the industry pushing it? engineers to spend money? Um, I think uh, the, the, the industry is definitely pushing it. Yeah. Um, Apple in particular. I don't think it's to force engineers to spend money, no. though. I mean, I don't know much about this, but what I've been told is that Dolby are basically a licensing company, right? They own the intellectual property on the Atmos system. They license it to people. The reason iPhones can play it back is they've all had a Dolby decoder chip in them since version 7. Apple pay a license to them for that. So there's immense value for Dolby as a company to get as much adoption as possible, which is why they're being so helpful going out and helping engineers set up and all the rest of it. Um, and I, I think, I mean, one of the cons that I didn't mention there, there's a potential negative, which is that we could have lots of people getting excited about this now, investing 10, 20,000 pounds in an Atmos setup for their room, and then finding that next year, actually, nobody's prepared to pay more than 100 pounds a mix. And that's not, you know, I mean, one of the things, another negative about this is it's very difficult or it requires a great deal of expertise to create a mix that sounds fantastic in Atmos and in binaural. That's what all these settings in the decoder are for, optimizing all that stuff. 
is a real challenge. So it's it's more time consuming. So they, they, you could have lots of people getting burned, which would be a shame. So it is definitely so it's a market stimulator in that sense. Then guys at the back. Um, okay, another one, another one from them. Um, what's wrong with listening to stereo, and why do I need to be in the middle of a band? That, that's what they. That's they, that's their interpretation of it. Rather. <laughs> well, I mean, no, that's a fair comment because you know one of the things that spatial does or Atmos binaural does that is harder in stereo is it makes stuff sound like it's coming out here. And one of the things that stereo does is it makes stuff sound like it's coming from in here. You know, it's right between your ears. Um, and lots of people, me included, like that, enjoy that. So you can have the best of both worlds because if you switch these binaural emulation things to off, then something that's panned center will still be in the middle of your head. Um, for me, I find it exciting. I just listen to... Uh, oh, the, so there's a new Porcupine Tree single came out in November. Stephen Wilson, uh, borderline godlike genius audio engineer. Um, and there's an Atmos mix of a, that and there's a stereo mix. They both sound amazing. They both have great dynamics. The Atmos mix sounds qu on earbuds in binaural sounds quite similar to the stereo, but the stuff that's moving around just moves around more. It just kind of catches you. You know, it's it's just, I enjoy it. It's just fun. It's just another... So I don't think anybody has to. I mean, another thing to say is that everything currently, nobody's saying stereo is going away. Yeah. Stereo is there. You know, if, if you disable it on your phone, you still hear the stereo versions. Everybody's very clear that the stereo is still the most important version. So basically, it's a case of both. So, so I, as it develops, it's likely that in the way that's maybe like mixing surround for cinema, you tend to put the dialogue in the center or, you know, and, and then you kind of, there are certain rules that, that, that mix engineers sort of follow more or less to, mm -hmm. to place things within the scene. So that's really interesting. I listened to my first Atmos podcast the other day. I didn't know it was going to be an Atmos, still be Atmos podcast. I was just listening and I was like, something's just behind Which one was it? I can't remember which one it was. I listened to loads of other, of the true crime junkies. Really sad, I don't know. Um, but it was, it was, it was, a, it was like a sc sort of scary scene and there was dogs barking behind and it was like walking through a woodland and it was like, actually, this is really quite, certainly for that, I, I, mm. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, okay, thanks very much to Ian. So a big round of applause everybody for Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.